I don't know at what age they no longer have that frequency of that, you know, that screech. <laughs> I don't remember. That was a long time ago. Well, take a deep breath. Uh, we got a lot of work to do this morning. You have the advantage you've had hopefully a little bit longer to sleep, maybe an extra two cups of coffee or something like that. Oh, be, because we're, we're at the start of a new series, we have to do a little bit of the groundwork. And so we have three things to cover this morning. Uh, one is a quick overview of Mark's gospel. You're like, wow, really? Yes. Uh, the second part is we need to do a, a brief introduction to the series itself, which is based on Mark's gospel and then we actually get to look at Mark's gospel, uh, the 11th chapter, and take a little bit more careful consideration of the text that was just said. I know that seems a little ambitious. We've got bowling and other things to do later on today, but we'll try to get it done in about 20 minutes or so this morning, we pray. Father, we acknowledge that you are the true God and that you have revealed yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. But apart from the gift of your spirit, we cannot understand that truth and we cannot receive that life in him. And so we pray that you would continue to work in our hearts uh, by your Holy Spirit. And that in these moments that you would grant us uh, ears to hear and hearts to receive your word and that it would transform the way in which we live in relationship to you and in relationship to one another. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first part is going to be what? We're going to do a quick overview of Mark's gospel. So why don't we start at the beginning of Mark's gospel? This is how he begins. He says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. By starting his gospel in this way, he doesn't keep his readers or his hearers, including us, in suspense. That from the very beginning, he reveals to us who Jesus is and who is he? He's the Son of God. And in the first half of Mark's gospel, this revelation becomes clear by the things that Jesus does. How do we know that he's the Son of God? Because he drives out demons, he raises the dead, he heals the sick, he feeds the hungry, he forgive sins. And so as the readers, we like, we know who this guy is, but everybody else is clueless. That despite all of these signs and all of these wonders, there's still this confusion that centers around Jesus. That everyone, not just Jesus' disciples, recognize that there is something different about him, something special about him, but they can't connect the dots. It's like having a dot-to-dot -dot with no numbers. You know, as kids, you would get the dot-to-dots, and all you had to do was follow the numbers or the letters. There are just lots of dots, and so they begin to connect them, but not necessarily in a way that's helpful. And, and we see that in... Mark chapter 8, so we go from 1 to 8. We're moving quickly. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 8, we see where that confusion comes out. You know the discussion. It's a pivotal discussion Jesus has with his disciples. They're gathered around him, and he says, Tell me, who do the people say I am? And as one, they say, well, some think you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some think you're Elijah that that the prophet has finally returned. Uh, some people think that you're just one of the other prophets, and then Jesus asks that follow-up question. I'm not really interested in who the other people say I am. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter, never one to be shy, blurts out, you're the Messiah. And we read elsewhere in, in one of the other Gospels that, that he doesn't think of that on his own, that he's given that divine insight, that he correctly identifies Jesus. He is God's Messiah. He is the one who has been anointed by God the Father for a specific purpose. And he, along with the other disciples, think, oh, this is great. Finally, the Romans are going to be shown the door, and we're going to reestablish the Davidic kingdom. But from this point on, as you read in this eighth chapter of Mark, Jesus gets very real with them. He says, yes, you're correct in your identification. I am God's Messiah, and now let me tell you what God's Messiah is all about. 
And then we get those famous words from Mark chapter 8 in which he says, the Son of Man must. It's not an option. That's one of those words in the scriptures that points to a divine necessity. Uh, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days be raised again. Clearly, that wasn't something they had in their purview. Some people have said that we can divide Mark's gospel into two parts, and those parts are separated by those rather telling questions in Mark chapter 8. And that we can summarize both parts with a single verse from Mark's gospel 10th chapter, 45th verse, it's a verse that all of you know, even if you can't quote it by book and chapter and verse. It's in that discussion about who's the greatest. And Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if we read Mark's gospel in light of that single verse, the first half deals with service, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve And then the second half is with sacrifice, but came to give his life as a ransom for many. And today's text falls in the realm of sacrifice. Today's text happens on Monday, the day after Palm Sunday. And what we see on that Monday and the days that follow, there are all kinds of questions that are being asked. Some of those questions are raised by Jesus' opponents. Some of those questions are raised by Jesus' disciples. And some of them are posed by Jesus himself. And each one is revealing. Each question, if we look deeply at it, has something to say about Jesus' identity and his purpose. And for our purposes today, I want you to think of them as forming a rebus puzzle. Now, some of you will know what that word is, and some of you are like, I have never heard of that term before. Uh, A rebus puzzle is a puzzle that uses pictures, letters, and or words to cryptically represent other words, sayings, and phrases. If you're old enough to remember the game show Concentration, yes, uh, they made use of rebus puzzles. So all of the contestants were challenged to figure out what those letters, pictures, and so forth represented so that those of you who weren't old enough uh, to watch the show Concentration and have no idea what rebus puzzles are, I'm going to give you a chance to uh, see if you can rise to the occasion this morning. So I have four rebus puzzles for you today. The first three are made up of words and letters, and the last one employs pictures. If you process things really quickly, don't blur it out because we're not all as bright and as quick as you are. Give us, the rest of us, uh, an opportunity to uh, catch up with you. So here's the first one. There's always one. (laughs) We have duct tape for you, my friend. (laughs) So what is it? Mark? Forgive and forget. We've got four gives and four gets, so it is the expression forgive and forget. Next one. Oh, the light just went on over there. (laughs) What is it? You are full of, and it's below the word knee. So yes, you are full of baloney. (laughs) This one's easier than the last one. Okay, try... And the two, and it's understand. Try to understand. Okay, last one. This one employs pictures. Oh, that, that's, those are blue jeans, by the way. (laughs) 
I heard you, Matt. Good. What is it? So you've got genes minus the A-N-S, which lays you J-E, and it's a bus, and the B in bus is supposed to be an S, so then you have S-U-S. Those are rebus puzzles. So the questions we're going to be addressing in all of the Sundays in Lent uh, have rebus puzzles associated with them. And you were supposed to get your first card today, but that didn't work out, so you'll get two cards next week. And so by the end of the Lenten season, you can put all of the cards together, and it will reveal to you um, who Jesus is, as if you don't already know, and uh, what he came to do. So that wasn't so bad. We've, we've done the first of the... First two of the, the three parts, we, we did a brief overview of the Gospel of Mark. Two parts, the, 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 the verse that summarizes it is what? 1045. That's the time you're hoping we're done. Uh, <laughs> Mark 1045, service and, and sacrifice. And then as the lead-in that all of the questions we're going to be addressing are like those rebus puzzles. They, they, it takes a little work. Uh, to figure out what they're saying, but all of them are pointing to Jesus. So now on to the text at hand. Out of all of the gospel accounts, today's account seems to be a bit off, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus just seems to be out of sorts today. Perhaps to use one of the newest words added to the dictionary, he was hangry. You know, he was angry because he was hungry. And, and, and as a result, we, we kind of sympathize with the fig tree, and that's a picture of a fig tree from the Middle East. Because as Jesus approaches it, he seems to demand the impossible. He appears to ask for figs out of season and knowing what we know about Jesus we would have expected him to respond a bit differently we would have expected him to respond with grace we might have uh, wondered why he didn't tell his uh, disciples Peter get the lopping shears and let's prune it or or uh, James and John go get a load of manure and let's go ahead and fertilize the tree and we'll come back next year and and see if there is indeed fruit we wonder why if he has divine power that he uses that power to curse the tree and destroy it rather than causing it to miraculously produce fruit all of those are good questions, but our sympathies are misplaced. Because the story really isn't about an innocent fig tree in the wrong place during the wrong season. It's about God's coming judgment on the temple in Jerusalem and its people who are anything but innocent. In fact, Jesus refers to that place as what? As a den of thieves. I mean, that's pretty harsh language. You know, that would be like Jesus coming in here and he said, oh, this is a, a den of thieves. And we're like, really? We, we didn't, uh, we're not doing unethical things in here. And so why would you deem this place uh, a den of thieves? So Jesus is not commenting on the things necessarily taking place in the temple. but rather the way in which people are using the temple. I mean, what he's driving at is the difference between being religious and being godly, is that the people who are coming there week after week after week imagine that they could do anything they wanted during the week, and they could do that without fear because at the temple they received impunity. That they could lie, they could cheat, they could steal, they could abuse others, and the only thing they had to do was come and offer up a sacrifice, and all was well. Again, it's 
not about an innocent fig tree. It's about God's people who are misusing his grace. And how do we know? Mark provides us with two clues. I told you you're going to have to work a little bit this morning. And the first clue is, is the word that he uses, which is season. And if we think of the word season, we think of like the botanical seasons, right? So it's not spring. It's not at a time at which we would expect there to be fruit. But that's not the word he uses. He uses a word that, that's pregnant with meaning. He uses a word that points to the coming of the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus. It's the same word that Jesus uses when he announces his Um, well, he makes his announcement as he begins his earthly ministry. It says that the time, it's the same word translated later on as season. It's the word kairos. It's this pregnant word. It's this really powerful word. He says that the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near in himself. And then comes the admonition, repent and believe the good news. And so if we were to couch Jesus' admonition in the language of today's text, Jesus is saying, be fruitful if in fact you believe the good news. Be fruitful if in fact you have received God's grace. It's not about being religious. It's about living in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The second clue comes in the structure. You can work through this this coming week that if you look at Mark's gospel, he employs this inside-outside pattern. And what's inside is the main point. And so what's the main point? What's inside of today's text? Is it about a fig tree or something else? It's about the temple. So we've got this discussion about the fig tree that surrounds the temple. We've got Jesus cursing the fig tree and then he raises havoc in the temple. And then the next day as they're coming from Bethany back to Jerusalem, that Peter says, hey, isn't that the tree? And not only is that the tree, but they notice that it's withered from what? It's withered from its roots up. And because it's withered from its roots up, no amount of time, no amount of pruning, no amount of cow manure is going to make a difference. And it points to the fact that the same is true for the temple. That all of the stuff going on there isn't producing anything. That the temple and what it stood for is dying and is on its way out. At some point in our Christian journey, whether it was in Sunday school or if we didn't get Sunday school early on in our formative years, it was later on, we have come to know today's text as what? It's the what of the temple, the cleansing of the temple. It's got spick and span, you know, the cleansing of the temple. And, and if you look at many Bibles, that, that's kind of the heading that, that is noted in there. It's the cleansing of the temple. But I think that's a misnomer because Jesus doesn't come to cleanse the temple. Early on, he's already said it's going to be destroyed, so there's no use cleaning it if it's going to be destroyed, and he doesn't come in to reform it either. And if that was his point, guess what? He was a failure. Because as soon as the money changers gathered up all of their loose coins, and as soon as they put the benches and the tables back up, guess what? It was back to business as usual. No, by his actions, Jesus was cursing the fruitless practices that were taking place at the temple. 
j- j- that just like the fig tree, it would soon be destroyed, and it would be evident to everyone that it would, in fact, be destroyed, but not before Jesus, and, and this is the thing we need to wrap our minds around, that he's the true temple. Wasn't that the things that they saw it was blasphemous? Jesus says, destroy the temple, and three days later... And so think about the timeline, that this happens on the Monday of Holy Week, that within a few days, Jesus himself is driven from the temple outside the city gates. And there Jesus is treated like the fig tree. That as people pass by, what do they do? Do they wish him well? No, they curse him. And as he hangs on the tree, they believe that he is cursed by God. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And the mistreatment Jesus receives is not due to the fact that he is barren. It's not due to the fact that he is fruitless, but rather it is a sign of his faithfulness as God's high priest. It is a sign of his faithfulness that he is the final sacrifice for sin. And when Jesus is raised from the dead, he bears fruit. You and I are evidence of that. He bears the fruit of grace, the fruit of faith, which shows itself in submission to Jesus. Authority, that submission, that that authority was a key issue for the religious leaders. And that's why they confront Jesus. That they think that they have divine authority at the temple and who in the world does Jesus think he is? And that's why they ask him the question, by whose authority? Who told you you could do these things in modern terms? Who do you think you are? And the reason why they ask that question is they do not recognize the one who stands in their midst. They they claim to know God. And they claim to worship him aright. But Jesus says you're religious but not godly that they refuse to submit to his authority and because they refuse to submit to his grace, they eventually submit to his judgment, a sure sign of his authority. Here's the painful part that when it comes to our own lives, we're not that much different. that during certain seasons of our lives, we question authority. Rather than submitting ourselves to Jesus and to his will and to his way, we say, who do you think you are? But the question is not, who does Jesus think he is? He is quite certain of his own identity, thank you very much. It's who do we think he is. And who we think Jesus is evident in the way in which we live. We either take the easy road or the hard road. We either live a life of grace bearing the fruit of faith or doing our own thing going our own way we walk down the way that leads to inescapable judgment. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that if we are merely religious, that you would bring us to conviction. For you have not called us to be religious as if we can live our lives some way out there and then come in week after week and receive absolution and then return to our lives as if we've never uh, experienced your grace, as if we did not believe the gospel. That you are calling us into a relationship with yourself, 
a relationship rooted in grace, a relationship made possible because you were like that fig tree that was cursed. We pray that you would enable us to lead godly lives bearing the fruit of faith. That if we are in one of those seasons in which we say, who are you as if you have no say over our lives, that you would show us the folly of our attitude and the end results of continuing down that path. Lord, we pray that as we submit to you that it would be done not out of fear but out of a sense that you have our best interests at heart and that your desire is for us to be everything that you have made us to be. And where we fall short of that daily as we all do, we pray that you would continue to remind us that you are that true temple and that by offering yourself that you gave the final sacrifice for sin for which we are grateful. And may that gratitude be evident in the way in which we speak and what we give ourselves to and how we interact with others. We pray all these things in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.